We're going to center our hearts to begin. So let us take a deep breath together. Holy One, help us to take this time to center on you, for you have made us, you give us life, and you continue to be with us in every moment, in every breath, in every step we take. I invite you to take another deep breath in and release it. Relax your shoulders and let all the tension go. Take another deep breath in and let it out. I invite you to pick up your stone that we gave you, your worry stone, your heart stone. I invite you to rub it. Mine says forgiveness today. I invite you to touch it. And be reminded that God's touch is within us and between us and around us, as close and as real as this object in our hands, is how close love to us is always. I invite you to imagine letting go of your worries into this stone into the heart of God's love. And will you pray with me? Into your care we offer now our worries, fears, and strife. We turn to you and know you're near, your light, our love, and life. I invite you now to bring the light of God, the Spirit's presence, into our midst by lighting your candle. We're going to share a story today about a meal that Jesus attended because it happened in an unexpected way. Listen for how people didn't recognize him at first. It took sitting down to a table for people to realize that Jesus was with them still. Every time we gather around a table, we can recognize that Christ is within us. Inside each one of us, every time we love each other by sharing food together, Here's how the story of Jesus' surprise visit on the road and at the dinner happened. Imagine yourself walking down the road and a stranger comes along. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place here over the last few days? He said to them, What things? They said to him, The things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying they had seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the woman said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he inter 
interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going to go on ahead. They, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took a seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got right up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, The Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. It had been a very long Holy Week that year. That year that I was in Wyoming, the pastors groups, the conservative group and the mainline group joined together. And so we did for the first time together our Holy Week services. And it turned out that all of the conservative pastors were chosen to preach that year. So Monday, we killed Jesus, and it was my fault. I was a sinful creature that led to his destruction. Tuesday, noontime. Again, I killed Jesus. It was my fault. I was a sinful creature. I led to his death and destruction. Wednesday, noontime. We killed Jesus. Again, because I was a sinful creature, I led to his death and punishment. He was destroyed because of me. Thursday, noontime. Jesus died again. That night, I was with my own church family, and we had our Monday, Thursday, slash Good Friday service. So I did kill Jesus that night. As we reflected on the events of Monday, Thursday, of sharing a meal together, of praying together. And then the tragedies of the next day of trials and execution. And we prayed and sang. And then Friday, noontime, we killed Jesus again. And it was my fault. I was a sinful creature. My sins led to his destruction. Friday night, 
I'm at Lynn's church. Good Friday. And we go through the trial and death of Jesus. To say the least, Lynn and I were a little worn out that Holy Week. For Jesus died over and over again, and I was being punished as the one responsible for killing him. And so that night after that last Good Friday service, we went to an Italian restaurant and ate. We broke bread and shared a bottle of wine. And we talked to each other from our hearts. And poor LeBron was there with us, hearing us pour out our angst about the way this Holy Week had gone. Hearing us talk about what was on our hearts. I wonder how those disciples felt that day. For they weren't experiencing Holy Week the way I did because I'm centuries removed from it. But every day along that journey, they had experienced something that happened. They had experienced Jesus getting angry about the way that worship was working, that the way the environment was set up. And he wanted it different. He wanted it better. They experienced a woman pouring out her tears and her oil to bless Jesus and how that led to a huge discussion about greatness and taking care of the poor. And yet had that underlying sadness of being anointed for death. They had experienced that Thursday where they, for the first time, shared a meal together where the bread was broken and the wine was poured. And Jesus told them to always do this together, to remember him. But why were they going to remember him? He was still there, present with them. And that night they went into the garden because Jesus wanted to pray, and he prayed, and they, from a distance, from a far distance, they could see his sorrow and anguish. And then the unthinkable happened. One of their own, one of the people who had been with them forever, who had heard everything about this new love, about the way to experience love, who had been at all their table meals, who had been there for the conversations. One of them kissed Jesus and betrayed him and he was arrested. And from there it was a trial and it was beatings and mocking and death. And even though this is Sunday night and they've heard from the women that Jesus has appeared to them, that death was not the final word, the text says they were still sad. And I imagine they were very scared. And so instead of staying there where they could be the next ones, they could be the next ones to be punished, They started walking to Emmaus. Maybe that was where one of their parents lived and they figured it would be a good place to get away. Maybe they were fearful that what had happened to Jesus would be coming for them. Maybe they just needed a place to grieve with people who understood them. And so they're walking on their way to Emmaus when a stranger appears to them and he asks them why they are so sad, he sees their sorrow and their grief, their anguish, and asks them why. And so they tell them, tell this stranger about what has occurred. 
they tell him, and they can't believe that they don't that he doesn't know about Jesus, that he hasn't heard about Jesus, that he hasn't experienced Jesus. So they tell him the story. They tell him all that they had experienced, all the love they had experienced in and through Jesus and the events that had happened in this last week. And then Jesus, because they still don't know who he is, don't recognize him. Ask them why they don't understand what's going on. Haven't they read their scripture? So he lays it out, going from, through all the scriptures from Moses to the present day, explaining what would happen when the anointed one came. They had this discussion, this Bible study, with Jesus himself telling them, about what would happen to the Messiah and what was to come and what would be and how an end was not the end but the new beginning, the new creation, the new heaven on earth. And even on that long walk of seven miles where he talked, they still didn't see him. They didn't get it. They didn't see who he was. And as they get to Emmaus, and Jesus is getting ready to go on. They invite him to dinner. And when they sit down at the table, Jesus picks up a loaf of bread and breaks it. And at that moment, they know who was with them. When that bread is broken open, they see from their hearts who had been with him this whole time. And at that moment, Jesus disappears from their sight. And instead of staying there, and even though they have already just walked seven miles, they hurry back to Jerusalem to that upper room and share with the other disciples, the other followers of Jesus, about their encounter. They share with them that Jesus had broken open the bread and they knew him. Diana Butler Bass, in her book, Strength for the Journey, tells a breaking bread experience. She says that the pastor that day in church was preaching on the Emmaus story. And he was arguing that what happens with Jesus is that we have a conversion from a faith based on fear to one based in love. And Jesus' followers had failed to recognize him because they were mired in fear. They were fearful of authorities that had killed Jesus. They were fearful that the body was gone they were fearful that they might be next. And only when they broke open the bread with that stranger did their fears go away. Jesus invited them to reject that fear and embrace God's love. And Diana Butler Bass says that that sermon hit home. And so when she was coming forward to receive communion and they were offering it to her, she broke down in tears. Because what she had been journeying towards, what she had been longing for in faith, where she had been going was finally real and true and new. That that bread broken open and given to her allowed her to see and experience a faith based in love. To know it and own it and be part of it. This story 
This Emmaus story invites us to break bread together, to share a table together, because when we share a table together, we become community. When we share a table together, we share all that stuff in our hearts. We break open our fear and our hurts. When we share a meal together, we're able to share love. And Jesus showed us that over and over again, from the start of his ministry to the very end, he broke bread with people. He invited them to the table, and at that table, they had some wild discussions. At that table, they met people who were not usually invited. In his stories, he told them of tables where the unwanted and the last and the lost would receive a welcome. At the tables, he offered us a way to be and experience what it means to be with and in the presence of God, to see God in our midst. table, not the cross, should be the symbol of our faith. For it's at the table that we become the body of Christ, that we are brought together in our many disparate and separate ways to become one. And yet I think this story speaks to us because we're living in that place of fear and sadness. Fear because we don't know if the next time we go to the grocery store, we will accidentally touch the wrong thing or somebody will breathe on us or sneeze on us or cough on us and then we'll catch the virus. Fear because we don't know and we can't control. We can't control what will happen. All we can do is the right things for ourselves, wear gloves, wear masks, wash our hands, and stay home. But we can still be afraid. Afraid for our parents who are far away from us and we can't see them and we can't control what is happening in their environment and we hear those stories of the nursing homes being the places where people are dying and dying and dying. So we're fearful and we're grieving. We're grieving the fact that our grandkids are growing and getting bigger and we can see the pictures, but we can't hold them. We can't hold them and make them laugh and smile the way we used to. And we're afraid for them. We don't want them to catch this disease, this virus. And we're sad and grieving because we can't be with them. And what this story says to us is that when you break the bread, anytime you break the bread, that that's the moment that you will see and experience God in your midst. That is the moment where you will recognize be open to the presence of the holy. That's the moment where you will be welcomed. When we eat and break bread, we have a moment where God's love is real for us. When I was thinking about this text, 
and remembering Lynn and I sharing a bottle of wine and poor LeBron. Our hearts were wide open that night. Broken open because of all the fear, the anguish, and just the hardness of that holy week. That breaking of bread together, that sharing of a big, huge bowl of pasta and a bottle of wine. Help us let it go. To release our sorrow and our grief. To remember the joy of the company of others. And this story teaches us that it will not last forever. That that grief and fear may be for a while, maybe for a long journey. But it isn't the last word. That there will be moments when you break bread and remember that every time you do that, you do it in remembrance of Jesus. Every time you break bread, you remember what he has meant for us and to us. You remember the love that he offered and still offers. <laughs> Let us pray. It's difficult in this moment not to be near some of the people we love and might be worried about. Take a moment and say the names of the people you wish were right there next to you. As we name them, they are present with us in our hearts. We also want to call in mind the people we cannot name, whose names we don't know, but we know they need our prayers and God's comfort. For those who've lost loved ones, for those who are sick and recovering, for those who are caring for the sick at home, in hospitals, in nursing homes and assisted living, for our first responders, for Native Americans, migrant workers, and incarcerated people, for those in the endless food lines, for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are feeling alone and isolated, for those who are helping and are so very tired. For those who are afraid. Let us take a deep breath of the Spirit. We know that God sends out our prayers and the Spirit. Breath of God is flowing from within us outward as a spirit of compassion. As we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I hid in the back room of our home, the only part made of concrete, as Hurricane Maria tore our house apart. 
When we finally came out, there was nothing left in place but my sewing machine. I have lived in this house for over 40 years. This is my home, my community. I am praying for the means to rebuild. I am Maria Trinidad, and to have my home back, it is almost more than I can ask or imagine. together across the UCC serve to help people that are facing extraordinary fearful conditions. People who are hungry, people who had a tornado come through, people who are being flooded. This money goes around the world bringing hope and love to those places that we can't visit on our own. So I want you to take a moment and decide and create a way to let more people know this message that Jesus gives us. You are not alone. I am here. I love you. What can we do to create more love in our households, in our families, in our relationships, with those we can't be with right now? How can we offer our love to those who are working so hard right now? How can we offer love to those who feel short on love, peace, or comfort? Make a plan today. Let us pray. God, may this love be spread far and wide. May these offerings that we give Spread that love to people and places we didn't even know we could touch. by Martha Spong. He walked ahead as if he were going on, the man they did not know. They liked the way he talked. They wanted more and called out, stay with us, break bread with us. He broke the bread and they knew him then, stay with us. But he's going on. And so we go on together remembering who and when, breaking the bread and telling the story. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will. That Jesus loves you and always will. That I love you and always will. May you act on that love straight from your heart. Amen. Amen. <laughs>